What a powerful message uh, in, in those words, taking um, a, a quote that most of us have probably heard before, but the majority of us probably don't know that it's even a misquote that, that is used. And, and I, I love what David Bowden says there, that we use it as an excuse for our laziness, an excuse for not sharing the gospel And we make up this thing that says if we just share it with our lives and not with our words, then we're sharing it. I love that. I love that idea. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in today's message. Um, But before we get there, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is John. I'm the associate pastor here. Um, And I do have the privilege of bringing you God's word this morning. As we've been working through the the gospel of Mark um, for... Well, longer than I have even been here. I think we're at about two years, um, over two years in the Gospel of Mark. Um, and so there may be a little bit, little bit of applause when I tell you we only have three weeks left. We have three weeks left in the Gospel of Mark, um, and then we will start on a new series. Uh, and it, it's going to be awesome. But I think even these last three weeks, don't check out. Don't check out on these messages because they are extremely applicable to how we're living our lives. And as we do that today, um, I encourage you to turn in your Bibles over to Mark 16, where you're going to read verses 9 through 11. If you would stand with me as we read God's Word, um, if we'll all read along together. It says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. Let's pray. Father God, you are an amazing God, an almighty God who who sacrificed your son on our behalf to, to suffer death on a cross for us, Lord. But you raised him on the third day, conquering death. And you've revealed yourself to your people in and through Jesus Christ. Father, we ask today as we we study your word and as we look at this that you would speak to us through your word. Father, use me as your messenger. Use me as your tool. Let my words be your words today, Lord. Don't let me speak on my own accord, but only by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for the gospel of Mark and the opportunity that we have had as a church to look at every single verse of this gospel and to study it and to look at Jesus' life. We thank you that we get to do that and we continue to do that today. We ask for your blessing on this time and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. Starting off today's message, I have to do something um, that I normally would not do from the pulpit. And I feel like this is something that I have to do because God has taken me over the last few weeks and beat me over the head with this idea several times. And it started three or four weeks ago in youth group in Warehouse 22. Uh, I was teaching the youth out of the Gospel of John. We've been going through the Gospel of John in Warehouse 22. And we got to this section, and uh, it started in chapter 7, verse 53, went through 8, 11. For those of you who, who know or don't know, uh, that section records a, a time in Jesus' ministry where the Pharisees try to trap Jesus, and they bring a woman who has been caught in adultery. And they, they want to see what Jesus is going to do. And they tell him, you know, the law tells us that she should be stoned. What are you going to do? They're trying to trap him. Well, I, I read through the section and I just jumped right in. I'm going to teach this section to the youth group. We're going to talk about all of these things. Just jumped right into it. And about, well, I don't know, maybe halfway through, a hand goes up from an observant young youth sitting there. He says, Mr. John, my, my Bible says that this section of Scripture is not included in the earlier manuscripts. And I thought, you're right. Mine says that too. And then I went right back to teaching. I completely downplayed it and I didn't address it at all. And later I was rebuked by my wife and says, you really handled that poorly. Um, <laughs> but to her credit, she was being completely honest because I did handle that poorly. I completely downplayed it, took no regard to addressing the issue. Well, a few days later, I got an assignment for a hermeneutics class that I'm in to write an exegetical paper on those exact verses. And I'm thinking, okay, God, you know, I just taught on this. 
My wife rebuked me for not handling it properly, and then you give me this assignment, okay, God, I get it. You want me to dig into this a little bit further, so I will. Well, then I look at the preaching schedule. And today's preaching is this section 9 through 11. And right before 9, if you're following along in your Bible, right before 9, uh, it says, some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 through 20. Well, all right, God, you got me again. I have to do it. And all of these things leading up to this leads me to what I have to do today that I normally wouldn't do. I need to take a moment out of my sermon to teach, not preach. There's a difference here. Right now, I'm about to give you um, what some students will call an, an information dump. Okay, I'm going to just pour out all of this information right on you. And it's information for you to know and understand, but not much that we're going to interact with. It's just kind of for your information. This is why this is here. And I'm going to try to connect it to life as much as possible so it doesn't just feel like a lecture, okay? Because lectures aren't fun. And most people don't remember much from lectures. But I want you to remember this. So as I read this, this note beforehand, it reminds me of, of when I was in the Air Force. When I was in the Air Force, I was an egress mechanic. An egress mechanic is a person who works on, maintains ejection systems. That's the, the seat that gets a pilot out of the aircraft when there's nothing left for him to do to save the aircraft. I loved my job. I loved working with my hands. I loved what I did. But one of the things that I loved about my job is we had to follow tech data. And what tech data is, is it's a list of instructions that details every single step of every single job that you are going to do. And in this tech data, you had to follow every step in order. You could not do step five before step three. Even if it could physically be done, you couldn't do it. You had to follow the steps in order. And in some of these steps, you would have right beforehand a caution, a note, or a warning, depending on the severity of what was about to happen. And it was designed to draw your attention to something that you needed to pay extra attention to. And it looked similar to this. And I know it's hard to read, but it, was, it would be right before a step, and it would say, caution, what you're about to do is important. Or warning, if you don't put that pin in correctly, you could die. Okay? It was important. It was very important information, but it was designed to, to clarify or warn about what was coming up. Well, as we get here, we get this same kind of note. The same kind of, just so you know, what's coming up is a little bit different than what you've been reading. So why is this note here in particular with this section in these verses? It's here because 9 through 20, the whole rest of the Gospel of Mark, is most likely not written by Mark. It's not written by Mark. And we know that it's not written by Mark because in these verses, 9 through 20, a majority of the Greek text that is used here is not used anywhere else in the Gospel of Mark. That means this section, these words are only used here. Well, we know that is not Mark's writing style. We know that's not how Mark writes. It's not how he communicates things. There's a certain set of words and phrases that he likes to use. None of it is seen here. These are all new to the Gospel of Mark. So it gives you some clues. Okay, maybe this wasn't Mark who's writing. But also, if you look at the text of what's being said, verse 9 starts with the word now. Now, it's connecting verse 9 back to the previous set of verses. It's kind of like the word therefore. When you see the word therefore, you look to see what it's there for. What is it connecting? Well, verse 9 doesn't actually connect at all to the previous verses. In verse 9, you see this um, gender-specific he. It, it, it refers to he. They're talking about Jesus. Now he rose on the third day. They're talking about Jesus. But it, there's an assumption that's made that, that what was happening before this was also in reference to Jesus. That Jesus was the subject of the preceding verses. But he's not. The women are. So you see automatically there's kind of a disconnect in ideas between 8 and 9, yet the word now is trying to connect them, and they're not connected. You also see that Mary Magdalene is introduced here as if she hasn't been talked about at all leading up to this section, even though she's just been mentioned three times in the verses before this. And, and the author of these verses addresses her as Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus cast out seven demons. You don't see that before. You just kind of get this idea that, 
This isn't Mark writing. You also, we, we see that it's not in the earliest manuscripts. And so you get this note, the earliest manuscripts, uh, and they give you this note because the earliest manuscripts are the most reliable ones in use for translation. And so the most reliable texts in creating the English translations don't include this section. So why is it here? If the earliest, most reliable manuscripts don't have it, why is it in my Bible today? Because. I mean, really, because. If you, it's really left there because while it's not in the earliest manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts, it is in a majority of Greek manuscripts. And so it's left in there based on tradition within the church. When you look at the church tradition, this has been included in the Gospel of Mark, even though it wasn't written by Mark himself. And so if it's left there because of tradition, we have to ask, is it Scripture? Because we know, and I could speak directly from the pulpit about this, tradition is not Scripture. However, 9 through 20 is Scripture. These verses, just because they're left there because of tradition, doesn't mean that they're not Scripture. This is God's holy and inspired Word. Whether Mark wrote it or not, it is God's Word. Everything that is mentioned in 9 through 20 is mentioned somewhere else in the Scriptures. It's all covered somewhere else. And as Christians, we never formulate any of our Bible study, any of the theses that we make out of Scripture, anything that we develop from Scripture based on one verse or one section. We always look to the whole of Scripture, the entire message of the Bible, to formulate our, our thoughts, to formulate what we know about God. We look at the Bible as a whole. We never look to Scriptures as a proof text. And what I mean by that is we never make up our mind about something and then look to the Bible to support what we have made up our mind about. That's called proof texting. We, as Christians, do this the other way around. We read the Scripture, we evaluate it in light of the entire book, the entire Bible, and then formulate our opinions based on that. So, yes, this is God's holy and inspired words, even if the earliest Greek manuscripts don't include it. And I know this because it's in my Bible. It's in the scriptures, and God is sovereign. God knows what he is doing, and he works in and through, and he, and he worked in this to put his word together. This is the God that we serve. Okay, that's my teaching. That's all of my teaching points. Now I can get into the preaching. However, the preaching on today's message isn't any easier than handling this, this note that we have beforehand. So before I jump too much into it, I want to read uh, the section again, but I'm also going to read the same account of what has happened from the Gospel of John, from John's perspective, to help illustrate what I was talking about, how we don't formulate our message based on one section. So our verse here again says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and he had been seen by her, they would not believe it. Now, in the Gospel of John, we have another account or the same account of this, uh, just from a different perspective. But John's perspective gives us a lot more details rather than Jesus appeared to her. She went to the disciples. They didn't believe her. So in John's account, <clears throat> starts. it's in John chapter 20. Sorry, I clicked one too many times. It's in John chapter 20, starts in verse 11, goes through 18. It says, But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that, she had, and that he had said these things to her. Okay, we have a few more details now about what's going on, what's happening, how all of these events unfolded, but even those details don't answer one of the questions that I had. That question is, why would Jesus choose to reveal himself first to Mary Magdalene? Why would Jesus reveal, out of all of the people that he could first reveal himself to after the resurrection, he chooses Mary Magdalene? Why? In my mind, I'm thinking, okay, it would be better for you, Jesus, to reveal yourself to your mother first. I mean, she's sad. She's obviously heartbroken over what's just happened. Wouldn't it be more effective for Jesus to go first to his mother to let her know that he's resurrected, that he is alive? Or maybe, maybe go to the disciples first so that maybe they'll believe that he's been resurrected. Because when Mary goes to them, they don't believe her. It almost seems like what has happened here is completely unproductive. Why would Jesus reveal himself to Mary Magdalene first? I mean, she does what she's told. Jesus tells her, go and tell the disciples that I've risen. She does that, but they don't believe her. They don't start to make preparations. They don't prepare for Jesus to be there. They don't go out and start spreading the good news immediately upon hearing of the resurrection. No, they don't believe her. So with this question in mind, why would Jesus reveal himself first to Mary Magdalene? I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about who God and Jesus choose to reveal themselves to. And I want to talk about how people respond to that. Who God and Jesus reveal themselves to. Before we can get into a really deep discussion on this, there has to be a disclaimer. And that disclaimer is that God has revealed himself to all creation. All creation has seen that there is a God, whether they choose to believe it or not. In Romans 1, verses 19 through 20, it says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Everything that we need to know about God, we know. It's been revealed to us. God has shown it to us, and we are without excuse. However, just because we're without excuse doesn't mean that people are going to believe it. It's kind of like common sense. It's not very common. Okay, Just because God has revealed himself to everybody doesn't mean that everybody believes it. It's... There are a lot of people who can look up at the sky and look at God's creation in this amazingly beautiful world that he's created and know that there's a God. I remember the first time that I saw the Northern Lights. I was up in northern Alaska. We were up near the Arctic Circle. I was deployed there with the Air Force um, running alert missions, silly stuff. Uh, But we were there, and I remember one night, it was late in the evening, I was walking out of the dormitory. 10, 20 degrees below zero. And I walk outside and there's a gaggle of people standing there, completely motionless, not moving a muscle and just staring up at the sky. And I walk out and my first thought is, what is wrong with these people? It's freezing cold outside and they're just standing here. And then it caught my eye. And I looked up and I joined this gaggle of people in complete, utter motionless, unable to move at the majesty of God as it danced across the sky and the most beautiful display that I have ever seen in my entire life. And I'm sure we looked silly standing there. But as soon as I saw it, exactly what went in my mind was, how awesome of a God do we have that he would put on this light show for us to see? That he would even think to mix these colors and have them dance across the sky in ways that you can't explain the beauty of. And then there are those people who look at that same thing and they think, oh, that's cool. It's cool how light bends and creates colors. And they deny that there's a creator. They deny that this creation screams of a creator. 
They shouldn't, but they do. Beyond a general revelation, God has revealed himself to certain people in a special revelation. This is something that God and Jesus both do. We see it with Mary Magdalene, how Jesus reveals himself to her. And even as he first spoke to her, she didn't know that it was him until he reveals himself to her. But this isn't something that is post-resurrection Jesus Christ only type revelation. Jesus has been doing this since the very beginning of his ministry. And even something as seemingly inconsequential as choosing the disciples. Jesus is choosing people who are going to come alongside him and do ministry with him and be very close and intimate and know who he is. Jesus is choosing them. We see in Matthew 17, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus chooses Peter, James, and John, above all of the other disciples, to go up on the mountain and to see himself transfigured, to see something none of the other disciples are going to see, to see something nobody else is going to see. Jesus chooses these men. We see it when Jesus heals a paralyzed man on the Sabbath as he sits outside the sheep gate waiting for the waters to be stirred so that he could go in and maybe be healed. And Jesus approaches this man and says, do you want to be healed? You know that that there are a ton of other people there needing to be healed, sick, injured people who need to be healed. You know that because when Jesus asks this, this paralyzed man, do you want to be healed? He says, sir, I can't be healed because every time I get up to try to go into the water, all these other people, they push me out of the way. I'm never going to get in there. This place is filled with people who need to be healed. Yet Jesus chooses this man, chooses this man to reveal himself to and to heal him, this man in particular. In Matthew 16, Jesus asks one of the most important questions ever to be asked. He asks the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Their response to him is, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others still say Jeremiah or maybe one of the the prophets. And then Jesus flips the script a little bit on them. He says, but who do you say that I am? Peter answers him correctly. Peter says, you are the Christ. But then Jesus tells us, tells him that the only reason, the only way that he could even know that is because God has revealed it to him. In John 6, 44, Jesus tells us that people cannot come to God unless God draws them to him. It is a work of God. So God and Jesus choose who, when, where, how they reveal themselves to people. Just like with Mary Magdalene. Just how Jesus reveals himself to Saul on the road of Damascus. They know what they're doing. But again, this isn't a new concept. This isn't something that's new in the New Testament. This isn't a a concept that pertains to Jesus only. This is something that's been going on since the very beginning of time. God has been choosing his people. You see it with Cain and Abel. God chose. You see it with Noah. God chose. Abram, God chose. Jonah, God chose. The Ninevites, God chose. Even the bad kings and the foreign nations, God chooses them to come in and to bring judgment on his people. But in all of them, God chose. Why would he do that? Why would God choose Abram of all people? Why would God choose Abel's sacrifice? What made his better? Why would God choose to reveal himself to Mary Magdalene? I don't know. That's the only answer that I can give, really. It's just, again, because. Because he wants to. Because he's God and we're not. Because his ways are not like our ways, and I'm glad that they're not, because if it was up to me to choose, I would mess that up every single time. Well, because man is messed up. Because we look at things differently. We are flawed, and apart from God drawing us into himself, we would never choose him. While we don't know why God chooses to reveal himself to some people and not to others, we do know that he uses us to do it. 
We do know that he uses his people to reach other people. He uses his creation to reach his creation. We see it when Jesus tells Mary Magdalene to go and tell the disciples that he had risen. She's the first person ever to be charged with sharing the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they don't believe her. The disciples of all people don't believe the message that Mary Magdalene brings about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, at one point in her life, Mary was possessed by demons. And that might have a a big effect on what the disciples are perceiving to come out of this woman's mouth. Not just one demon, but seven of them. And Jesus has to cast out these seven demons from her. And so maybe because of that, in the eyes of the disciples, maybe she's not a very believable or trustworthy person. I don't think that's the case, though. When you look at how Jesus interacted with Mary Magdalene after this experience and how Mary Magdalene interacts with Jesus... I don't think that she's not an untrustable person or untrustworthy person. I think what it is, is the disciples had been with Jesus. They had heard Jesus talk about his death multiple times. They had heard Jesus speak of the resurrection, but they had no idea what he was saying. They couldn't grasp in their finite mind the details surrounding what was going on. And now their friend and their teacher has been crucified and suffered death on a cross and they were together and they were mourning the loss of such a good friend. Their hearts were not ready to receive the good news. Their hearts were not ready. This doesn't excuse them though. They're not excused from their disbelief just because their heart's not ready. We'll talk about it in a couple weeks as we continue through the Gospel of Mark. But Jesus rebukes them for not believing Mary as she came and told this good news. Just because their heart's not ready doesn't mean they're without excuse or they're with or they have an excuse to not believe this. So Jesus and God use people to share the gospel with others. They use creation to reach creation, but not everybody's going to respond in a positive manner. The next couple verses in Romans 1, 21 through 23, talk about this. Remember, Paul has just said they are without excuse. He says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds, and animals, and creeping things. I love, I love these verses. I love them because they remind me of something that I often overlooked when I would study the fall. And I, I never even caught on to this until I heard a sermon on it one day several years ago. And I think about Adam and Eve in the fall and how they exchanged what they had for the possibility of what they had. They were so deceived by Satan and his his ways, he said, if you eat of it, you will be like God. And they were deceived and they ate. They were already like God. They weren't going to get any closer to being like God. They're created in the image of God. And they exchanged what they had for the possibility of nothing. They were deceived into believing a lie. I digress. That's not what this sermon is about. This verse in Romans 1 illustrates that not everyone with whom the gospel is shared is going to acknowledge him as God. Think about this. In Romans, the book of Romans is written by Paul. He's writing and addressing this, but his life illustrates the truth of what he's saying. Before Paul was Paul, he was Saul. Okay? He knew who Christ was. He was actively persecuting people who were sharing the gospel, which means he knew the gospel. He's heard it. He knows the stories. He knows who Jesus was and what Jesus did, but he chose not to believe it and instead chose to persecute it. He stood by and watched Stephen get stoned, giving his approval, nodding as a man of authority. Yes, this man needs to be stoned, and Stephen becomes the first Christian martyr. What we know of Stephen and the fact that he's a Christian martyr was as he was being stoned, He was probably sharing the gospel. 
sharing the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ with the very people who are throwing stones at him. And Paul is standing there nodding in approval. I can't imagine that Stephen was silent as he was stoned. And I don't know how many encounters it took for Paul before he accepted Christ, before he became Paul. I don't know how many times it took somebody sharing the gospel with him. I don't know how many times it took for him to hear the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I do know that every single one of those was meaningful. And so when Jesus reveals himself to Saul on the road to Damascus, it is powerful and it is mighty and he can no longer run from the truth. And I think about the people who may have shared with Saul or with with Paul, however you want to address him along the way. And they may have walked away from that situation feeling like a complete failure. I've tried to share the gospel with this man and he didn't receive it. They may have felt like a failure, but the truth is they weren't. Because each of those touches, each of those times of someone sharing was meaningful. I also know that when people were sharing the gospel with Paul, when people were sharing the gospel uh, in the early church, they were using their words. They were speaking the gospel, sharing the truth vocally with people who are there to hear it. You don't see Peter stand up at Pentecost and say, Brothers, look at how awesome of a life we live and how different we are than you. Look at us. That's not what he does. He stands up and he says, This Jesus whom you've crucified, and it cuts people to the heart. He speaks the gospel with his words, and he lives the gospel with his life. I think about my own life and how many touches along the way it took before that I surrendered to Christ. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up a Christian. I was an adult when I accepted Christ. And I think back to all of these touches and all of these people who spoke to me along the way. And I, one man in particular, his name is, is Les Bramlett. I knew him at the time as, as Technical Sergeant Bramlett. And I remember him sharing with me. I had no idea what this man was talking about. And I didn't break down right there and accept Christ. I didn't surrender my life in front of him. I left there that day, and he probably felt like a failure. Until several months later, his words are what put me in chapel. His words are what made me go to chapel and accept Christ because it was meaningful, and it mattered. And I talked to Sergeant Bramlett He's retired from the Air Force now, retired as a chief master sergeant. Um, He's pastoring a church in San Antonio, Texas. I called him up before Christmas this last year um, through my wife's successful Facebook stalking and um, finding, she can find anything on the internet. She's she's a ninja. Um, But we, we found him and I called him up because I wanted to share with him how impactful he was in my life and how it had changed everything for me even though at the moment when he shared it, it didn't make a difference one way or the other. Just because God and Jesus choose and the Holy Spirit convicts doesn't mean that we're exempt from sharing the gospel. You never know which touch you are along the way. You never know which one you're going to be. You never know how that person might respond. But what you do know is if you share the gospel you're successful. If you share, you succeed. Mary Magdalene did not fail at what she was assigned to do. She didn't fail at sharing the gospel just because the disciples did not believe her. No, she did her part. She did what Jesus told her to do. She went and shared the good news of Jesus' resurrection with the disciples, and they chose not to believe her, but she was successful because if you share, you're successful. Say it again. If you share, you are successful. Paul illustrates it for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 4 through 9 says, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who puts or he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. 
For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. The city church of Corinth wasn't saved because of Paul. He just planted. It wasn't Apollos either. He just watered. The city church of Corinth was saved by the work of God and the Holy Spirit in that city to bring people unto himself. But that doesn't mean that Paul and Apollos were exempt from the work that God had for them there in that city. When you share Christ, when you share the truth of his resurrection with your words, vocally speaking those words, you are either planting or you are watering. You don't know which one you're doing, but it doesn't matter. Eventually, the disciples believed that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Some had to see it. Others needed more than seeing it. Eventually, they came to believe the truth of what Mary Magdalene had been telling them. I think about Jim Elliott, a Christian missionary to the Ecuador people, um, speaking to these tribes up in the mountains who, who know nothing of Christ. And he had some successful encounters with the people there, so he decided that he and a team were going to go in and to share the gospel with these people. And they went in and shared the gospel, and they killed him. Killed him, killed everybody who was with him. But he didn't fail. That wasn't a failed mission of him sharing the gospel. His wife, Elizabeth, continued his work, and after learning the language, went back into that village and continued to share the gospel with the very people who had killed her husband. And they came to know the Lord. You see, Jim Elliot planted and his wife watered, but God worked in that village to bring people unto himself. None of them were exempt. They were successful because they did their part. They shared the gospel. So what? So what? We have to live out the gospel. We have to live it out. And it, it takes words to live out the gospel. It takes sharing your faith. I'm going to read uh, a portion of a, a book, just one paragraph. Um, it's a book on evangelism. Uh, it's written by Nine Marks. I encourage you guys. They're short. They're like 120 pages, but they have tons of these books on different topics. This one um, is written by... J. Max Stiles. I'm going to have it on the screen, but I'm going to read it to you. And this is what I want to leave you with. It's on living out the gospel and what that looks like. Oh, sorry. I may have clicked again, Joe. It says, understanding the gospel as a way of life means making sure our lives align with the gospel in every part. This helps the gospel come out of us, whether we are with believers or non-believers. If we live gospel-centered lives, we will find ourselves sharing the gospel. If our fellowships know how to apply the gospel in all of life, they will explode with gospel-centered evangelism. I want to read just one of those lines again. It says, if we live gospel-centered lives, we will find ourselves sharing the gospel. I think the antithesis of that is also true. If you find yourself not sharing the gospel... You're not living a gospel-centered life because this good news is too good not to share. Because the truth of the good news is if you really do love people, you want them to hear the good news. We have to do our part. And it's not up to us how the people respond, but it is up to us whether we're going to choose to follow God and share the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, you, you are an amazing God. You choose to reveal yourself to us, even beyond creation, even beyond this amazing, beautiful world that you created that works so intricately, Lord. You reveal yourselves to us. You've revealed yourself to me. And I thank you for that today, Lord, that you have chosen me and that you have brought me into your family, adopted me as a son. Father, I pray that, that we hear the words that you have spoken today through me, that we hear this message and that we don't neglect it, but we go out from here and we live the gospel in every aspect of our life, not just on Sunday morning or Wednesday night or whatever it may be, Lord. Not just when we're here in this building, but we would live the gospel in everything that we do. 
And we know that living the gospel requires sharing it and speaking these words. So Father, convict us of that today. Convict us of that as we leave here. Show us the opportunities. Bring people into our path and our lives whom we would share the gospel with and don't let us back down or cop out with quotes like what was said on the bumper video, Lord. Don't let us do it. Let us live boldly for you. Let us live boldly right now as we give back in this time of tithes and offerings, Lord. Take this this offering from us, Lord. Multiply it. Let us give with a sacrificial heart to you and to the mission that you have in this church and in this community, Lord. We ask for your blessing on these tithes and offerings. We ask that you bless the, the giver as well, Father. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.